Man, y'all braved the snowstorm again. This is just amazing. I know some of you were sitting on pins and needles yesterday waiting for the vast amounts of accumulation. And uh, yeah, hey, we're glad that you're with us. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks also for you, uh, the Facebook audience out there, or if you're listening to this at some other point, let's welcome them, would you? We want to say welcome. However you're listening in, we appreciate the fact that you are doing that. Hey, this morning when you came in, you got, you got maybe a sheet of paper, and on the back side of that, uh, you will find a place to take some notes. And so we're going to invite you to do that. So just be aware. You've got something uh, there to write on. Hopefully you've got something to write with. And at the bottom of the page, there's the GPS, and that stands for Grow, Pray, and Study. And that's what we're talking about. And so we want to invite you into the opportunity to to grow and to pray and to study together the Scripture that we've kind of picked out. We all know we need to be reading the Bible somehow or another. Hey, let's read the Bible together. These are the passages of Scripture that we think would be important for you in your faith journey. And so we are starting a new series. And so this series that we're starting aha it's going to tie in a number of themes it's these eye-opening revelatory uh, moments we talked about this last week last week was sort of the uh, prequel if you will and it was this notion of hey it's when you wake up in the year oh it's a year of what what was the word awakening that's right some of y'all need to wake up already okay I know it's been a week but it's okay so uh, it's awakening and so it's these uh, epiphany moments these revelatory encounters with God it's the times when our eyes are open and we see differently and probably this morning we're going to walk into Luke chapter 3 and we're going to kind of walk through some selected passages in Luke chapter 3 if you want to open your Bible you can Uh, love to have you do that or turn your Bible on whatever it is and so we're going to be in Luke chapter 3 but Probably, I'm thinking, one of the greatest aha moments in your life that you'll ever experience is going to be parenting. Parents, say amen. Amen. Because, here's the why, because it's this moment when you realize that you, you have been entrusted with another human life and you have absolutely no clue what you're doing, right? It's that moment, it's that first step into parenting. It's also, it's also the realization that life isn't about you anymore, right? It's now about this other human being, or and and then hopefully maybe it will expand into other human beings. That suddenly all of these people are now a part of your life, and so you remember. Right, some of you remember parents, grandparents. You remember what this is like, and sonograms, and ultrasounds, and all the things, and the baby showers, and it's all the shopping, and it's deciding on what color we're going to paint the nursery, and it's the assembling of the crib. Make sure you assemble the crib in the baby's room. Don't do it in the the dining room or some. Nope, it won't fit. You got a problem. It's learning how to put a car seat in a back seat. Right, that which is that's a that's an act of God in and of itself figuring that out for the very first time. And then it's, it's all the other things that go along with it as well. It's birthing classes and reading books and all that stuff, even only to discover you really still don't know what you're doing. And then you run back to mom and dad and let mom and dad kind of help in the process. But there's also this space where, where really one of the cool parts of this is the name, right? It's the naming idea because we're going to name our children. We want to give our kids a name, that, that something that they can live in into uh, an identity or a hoped for legacy and something that also if we're just going to be honest it will prevent them from getting beat up on the playground right I mean this is it so there are some people that they name their kids different names and you know they're looking for like hidden meanings or, or just biblical meanings or embedded ideas embedded meanings whatever or some people just like this one clueless couple bless their heart they just kind of decided they wanted to give their daughter a random middle name And that's what they did. Literally, they named her Random. So her middle name is Random. No kidding. What are parents thinking, you know? Like, I mean, when they, when they come to these kind of moments, like we think about names and, you know, this is what Gay and I, my wife, we wanted to do. We wanted to name our kids a name that, that they could live into. And so, you know, as, and so that's what we tried to do. Gave them a biblical name with a good meaning. And, and I, I, the original name for my son that I kind of picked out in my head, uh, when I looked and I found out the meaning of the name, the meaning of the name was crooked nose. And I went, nope, not going to name my boy that. You know, just 
How do you live into that identity? I don't know. I said, we just you know, kind of walked away from that idea. But in your Bible, sometimes you'll notice that there's places, like you'll see a footnote after somebody's name, and you'll, you'll look down, and you'll notice, and it'll say, give the meaning, like the name Isaac. The name Isaac means laughter, and that was because you know Sarah laughed over the notion that she was going to have uh, a child. Aaron means teacher or, or, or mountain of strength, and John means grace or mercy of the Lord. And so it's very common to, to do this, to give our kids names. Jesus was a very common name, believe it or not, in his day and age. I mean, you know, we don't find too many people. Like, you know, if you meet somebody nowadays, they go, hi, my name is Jesus. You're like, oh, well, okay, we're glad you're here today, Jesus, you know, or whatever. But, I mean, you know, it was a really common name. Jesus in English, uh, Isus in Greek, uh, Yeshua in Hebrew, and, and it's the same name, right? Yeshua. So this is, this, is, this is it. This is his name, a very common name. Yahshua. Sound familiar? Joshua, right, exactly. And so it's, it's just Joshua. So Mary would have walked outside, right, called Jesus for dinner and gone, Joshua, <laughs> right, Yeshua, <laughs> you know, dinner's ready kind of thing. And so this is it. But if you know the meaning of his name, Joshua means the Lord will save or God saves. Or you can shorten it to just this idea of salvation. And so Jesus' name, listen, Jesus' name and his life are one. And they show the meaning. They show the meaning. And they show his identity. And they point out his destiny. Because remember back in Matthew what it said? This is kind of the thing you see in like the Advent season. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says these words. That she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. That this is what he's come to do. Like, he is going to do his name. He's going to live into his name. And so consequently, what we have is, is, is John, who's there. John the Baptist, it's his cousin. And he's there, he's getting the people ready. And, and, and there, there's this there's strong messianic hope. There is this expectation in the people of the day that the Savior, the Messiah, the promised one of God is going to show up and do something. We see this, if you've got your Bible open, you can go to Luke chapter 3. Verse 15, it says these words, Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. Let me ask you a question real quick. We're just point of application right out of the gate. When you come here, do you expect to meet with God? Don't answer. Because I want to say you should. I know you come here and you, you're here to see friends or you're kind of here to get charged up for the week or, you know, and, and listen, I don't want to take away from the, re, from the family reunion factor, okay, because that's a beautiful thing and it's good when you can connect with friends and you can see people and, and you see people that you hadn't seen in a while and it's like, and that becomes a family reunion. You're like, oh my gosh, welcome home and it's so good to see you and that's beautiful and it's wonderful, but the reality is this, that when you show up, do you expect to encounter God, or is it just, I'm at church again. And sometimes, if we're honest, that's where we are. Now, I don't know about you, but lately, for me, just I'm going to speak only for myself, I'm waking up on a Sunday morning, and by Saturday night, I'm kind of going to bed, and I'm kind of ready. I, I'm, I'm ready for what's going on, because I get up in the mornings, and here's what I'm saying on Sunday morning. I'm saying, Lord, who's getting saved today in your house? Lord, what are you going to do today at church? Because I expect expect you to show up. God, I expect people to encounter the presence of a living God, not a dead history figure. Amen. Right? This is it. Do you expect that? You should. You should. You should. We should. I mean, God, what addictions are you breaking today? What marriage gets restored? What lost person who feels as hopeless and as lost as a ball in high weeds chooses to find the fact that they have a God who knows them and knows their name and calls them out of the wilderness into a place of intimacy and relationship, right? That's it. Man, I'm waking up on a Sunday morning and when I'm coming to the hill, I'm just waiting for God to show up. I'm listening to people I encountered a dude there this morning. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm good. He said, but my back is hurting. Inside of me, it's like, it's an opportunity for Jesus to heal somebody. <laughs> now, I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to pray. In my head, this is all happening in a matter of seconds. I just said, I'm going to pray for this man to get healed. 
If God heals him, hallelujah and praise the Lord. But if God don't heal him, hallelujah and praise the Lord because it's on Jesus, not me. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to step in. I'm going to expect God to show up and move. Somebody say amen. amen. This, is, this is what you should do. There's a high messianic expectation. They expected the Messiah to show up. They were expecting God to be in the room. John, on the other hand, John is no Messiah. He's the forerunner. He's the announcement person, right? He's the guy who shows up to say, hey, by the way, I uh, just want to point you to the dude who's coming. He's on his way. He, he's baptizing people for repentance of sin. He's not baptizing people in his name. He's not baptizing people into his identity. He's not baptizing people into his destiny. I baptize you in the name of me. No, 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 no. <laughs> he's not doing that. He's not. But guess what? He knows the one who will. He knows the one who will baptize, like he says in Luke, with, with, with spirit and with fire. And that's what he says. That's who he says the guy's coming. He says, I baptize you with water. One coming after me is going to baptize you with spirit and fire. Church, I'm just saying bring it. Right? Like, th- th- this is what we should be waiting for. And then suddenly it happened. The name above every other name appeared. The one called salvation. The one called God saves walks up. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 says these words. One day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. Watch this. Jesus presents himself to be baptized. He walks in and he takes a posture of solidarity and unity and identification with a nation and a world of sinners. And Jesus leaves his home in Galilee, comes down into the Judean wilderness in this area, down near the Jordan, wherever that is, that particular space is located. And he presents himself there at the start of his public ministry. And you know what he does? Basically, Jesus, he just gets in line. He just gets in line. Just like, just like when you come to the table every week and you get in line and we form these lines and we come in lines and you're sitting there and you're walking and maybe you're singing the song with the band as they're singing or maybe you're praying or maybe you got your hands open, you're ready to receive or you're, you know, you're getting your own heart right before God, whatever it is, you're just standing in line and guess what? Jesus is right there. You ever thought about Jesus standing in line? There's a person, generally, when you come to the table, there's a person in front of you and there's a person behind you. And you know what? You you know what kind of people you have getting baptized? All kinds. All kinds of people. You got good people, you got bad people. I mean, just read Luke chapter 3, like tax collectors and sinners were getting baptized. And they're asking John, hey, what do we need to do? Soldiers and police officers, military personnel were getting baptized. Hey, what do we need to do? Regular folk were getting baptized and they're asking John, hey, what do we need to do? And John's like, do this and do this and do this and do this and do this. And they're all standing in line, in-laws and outlaws, everybody. And they're just, they're just in line and there's Jesus. And he's standing in line, doing what? Identifying with people. Somebody's like, hold up, whoa, 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 hold up. Now, I know that John was baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. So his is a baptism of repentance. Are you saying that Jesus needed to repent? Are you saying that Jesus had sinned? No, no, absolutely not. Because here's what the scripture teaches. Let's go back into the word because we're always safe on, on safe ground when we stay in there. So here's what Paul says. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For God made Christ who, what? Never sinned. Come on, wake up, we, work with me. To be the offering for our sin, here's the why, so that we could be made what? Right with God through Christ. We can be made right with God. Jesus didn't sin. Peter, his own disciple, says these words in 1 Peter chapter 2. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. And then the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, says this. This high priest of ours understands. Pause. Jesus understands you, sir. Ma'am, Jesus understands. He understands you. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do. Yet what? Yet he did not sin. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. So why does Jesus, why does Jesus need to be baptized and, and go under John's baptism if he never sinned? Because this John's preaching a baptism for, for forgiveness and for repentance of sin. I'm going to answer the question, why did Jesus need to be baptized by way of a story? And it starts in 1844 when a gentleman by the name of Wilhelm Ten Boom started a prayer meeting in his home or in the area outside of Amsterdam. And he was praying for Jewish people. And so he's praying for all the, he's praying for Jewish people that Jewish people would come to know the, the Messiah their, their, as their Savior, and Jesus. And so he's praying and he imparts the same love and the same prayerful, uh, fervent attitude into his son, 
Casper Ten Boom, who would later do the same thing in his daughters, Corey and Betsy Ten Boom. And they, this went on for like 100 years until into the mid-40s, 1940s, at the height of World War II, when the Ten Boom family outside of Amsterdam were hiding Jewish people from the Nazis in their home. They were discovered, and they were all sent off to the concentration camp. Of course, the father, long since gone, the grandfather to Corey and, and Betsy Ten Boom, long since gone. Betsy died in the concentration camp. Will uh, Casper died in the concentration camp. Corey lived, and Corey went on to write the best-selling book, The Hiding Place. If you've ever heard that, it was later made into a movie, The Whole Nine Yards. Phenomenal, phenomenal story way back in the day about that. But, but when they're standing in line, and the Jewish people were receiving the star of David, right, to identify who they were, Casper Ten Boom stands in line, and he received the same star. He, he received the same uh, yellow Jewish star, the same uh, identification, if you will, uh, with, with their, their shame and their struggle. And he was willing to be persecuted in identification with the people that he had so grown to love. Jesus didn't have to be baptized. Jesus identified with you. This is the idea. Jesus didn't have to. He didn't have to, to much like Casper Timbu, he didn't have to wear the star. He chose to wear the star. Jesus didn't have to be baptized. He chose to be baptized. He chose to identify with us in this moment. In other words, I could tell it to you this way. You should snap a picture of this or write this down. Walk with this through the rest of the week. In Jesus' baptism, he identifies with you. In your baptism, say it with me, you identify with him. You know what this is, right? You know what it is? It's an aha moment. It's the moment when the light bulb went off and you went, oh, oh, oh. oh wow. He identified. He identified with me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to identify with him. Exactly. That's exactly right. This is why Paul the Apostle would later write to the church in Rome, Italy. He would say these words in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Did you forget that all of us become part of Christ Jesus when we were baptized? In our baptism, we shared in his death. This is this mystical, supernatural union with Christ. He knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to struggle. He knows what it's like to lose loved ones. He knows what it's like to walk through hardship. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to be you. Because he's been us. He's been human. Our God has come to identify with, with you. It's an awakening moment. It's an aha opportunity. It's a chance for the revelation and the goodness and the power and the identity and the destiny of God to rest and reside where? In you, on you. Not for you, but for the world. So that you become the light of the world, right? Right? This is it. Where's Jesus? Standing in line. Standing in line, just walking up, right? Standing in line. What's he doing? Did you see it? Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Here it is. As he was praying, he's praying. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and then the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. There it is. So here's no other gospel talks about Jesus praying more than Luke. Luke talks more about Jesus praying and gives us examples and places where Jesus prays more than any, any of the other gospel writers. So Luke talks a lot about prayer. Luke also talks more about the Holy Spirit than any other gospel writer as well. And so you've got, you've got prayer and the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, that same idea carries over into Luke's second book, the book of Acts, because Luke wrote Luke and Acts. And so when the disciples see the movement of God, it's because of prayer and the Holy Spirit. What's the point? If it's important to Jesus, this aspect of prayer and the Holy Spirit, guess what? It should be important for you. What's important for your life is to be praying and to ask and to see the movement of God in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer. Right? Say yes. Okay, I'm going to let you unpack it all, but I'm just telling you. Luke is saying this is important. If it's important to Jesus and it's important to the early church, it should be important to you and it's important to this church. So here's what we're doing. We're praying. We're, what are we praying for? Well, I don't know about what you're praying for. I mean, I'm praying for a lot of things, and you probably are too, and you got some friends, and there's a marriage, or there's a relationship, or there's a thing, or a deal at work, or school, or you got some health stuff, or family members, or whatever. Yes, to all of that kind of stuff, but, but over, over all that is this. I'm praying for awakening. 
I'm praying for awakening because here's what I believe. I believe we won't have an awakened nation and we won't have an awakened state and we won't have an awakened community. We won't have an awakened church until we have awakened people that are filled with the power and presence and person of the Holy Spirit and who are willing to identify with the one who came to identify with us. And his name is Jesus and that means salvation. What's in a name? I want to say everything. Everything is in his name. And you know what? We believe that everybody is a recipient of the grace of God. Everyone can receive this identity. Everybody. This is one of the reasons why we, we, baptize, we baptize infants. We baptize babies. We baptize children. We baptize teenagers. We baptize adults. We, people have a, a, a wrong thinking sometimes, though. We in the United Methodist Church, we don't baptize believers. No, absolutely we baptize believers. Of course we do. We, we, we'll, we'll, baptize, we'll baptize everybody. We just want you to know why you're doing what you're doing. We believe that everybody is a recipient of the grace of God. And so when, when, when parents bring, bring their children uh, for baptism, and I, I stand there and I'll say, what name is given this child? And they'll say that name. It's almost like we're, we're, we're proclaiming that this person is stepping into an identity. They're, they're stepping into who God has named them and who God has called them to be. And when adults come and they're baptized, whether it's, it's by, by, by the, any mode of baptism that we will, we will celebrate, whether it's sprinkling or pouring or immersion, whatever you would want, we would do in that space. If you've never been baptized, then in that moment we name, and I, and I will say someone's name, so and so I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's it. And, and, and it's this moment when you step into this place of recognizing who you are as a child of the Most High God. This is it. And so in Jesus' baptism, it's this moment when we get to see, it's, almost, it's this inauguration of the kingdom. It's this coronation moment. For the kingdom, when Jesus comes, it's seeing the activity of the Trinity in action. In Luke chapter 3, verse 22, we see these words. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Suddenly, salvation, Yeshua, salvation becomes beloved. You know what beloved means? It means esteemed. It means uh, dear favorite or worthy of love. To be beloved means that you are, well, what some of you already knew you were, God's favorite. <laughs> All right? I have a friend of mine who, <laughs> she, she'll say, she'll, she'll periodically, she'll, when I'm with her, she'll go, you know God loves you, but I'm his favorite. I'm like, yeah, I know. I, like, but I think I'm his favorite. Actually, guess what? <laughs> we're all his favorites, right? Like, this is it. Like, we're all God's favorite. We're God's favorite child. We are, ladies and gentlemen, here's what I want to say. Mom and dad, listen to me. Affirm your children. Give them this blessing. You are my son. You are my daughter. With you, I am well pleased. You bring me great joy. Affirm your children. Affirm your grandchildren. Put your hand on their head. Bless them. There's not a, there's not a grown man in this room who doesn't want the affirmation from their father there's not, or mother. There's not a grown woman in this room who doesn't want the affirmation from her mother or her daddy. Affirm your children. Bless them, mama. Bless them, daddy. Grandparents, bless your kids. Bless your grandkids. It doesn't matter how old they are. It doesn't matter what they've done. Affirm them. Why? Because God in heaven, when you step across that line of faith, he affirms you, sister. He affirms you, brother. Right? He does. This is the God that we serve, gang. This is who it is. Elsewhere, we find this in another translation. It says, you are my son and I love you. I'm very pleased with you. Oh, there's, you want to hear these words. You want to hear these words and I would tell you that you can. I would tell that you can. I would say you, you heard these words at your baptism, whether you really heard them or not. You say, oh, I was only like three months old. I don't remember my, my, my baptism. You don't have to remember your baptism. God does. Whose memory are you relying on, yours or God's? Rely on God's. It doesn't matter if you remember. It doesn't matter. God remembers. You know what you get to do? You get to remember. 
You get to remember your baptism. You get to know that you were claimed by God. And it doesn't matter if you were 66 or you were six days old. It doesn't matter any point in between or beyond. Whatever it was, when you come to the waters... You can dip your finger into the water. You can trace the sign of the cross on your forehead. You can remember that God has claimed you. I had a worship professor when I was in seminary, and it was raining, and we'd be walking across campus, and he'd be kind of running across campus with his umbrella and whatever, and you'd say, good morning, Dr. Ruth. And he would say, remember your baptism and be thankful. (laughs) Theology nerd, you know. But yes, when you're standing in the shower, remember your baptism and be thankful. On a rainy day, remember your baptism and be thankful. When you come to church and you find the baptismal font wherever it's located and there's water in there, dip your finger into it, trace the sign of the cross on your forehead, remember that you are the baptized, if you have been. And be thankful. And remember that the words that Jesus heard when he hadn't performed any miracles and he hadn't raised the dead, they were just already bestowed and spoken over him. So it wasn't based on his achievement or his doing. It was based on his being. Because you're a son or a daughter of God, right? This is what we do. So in baptism, what do we do? We come and we identify with Jesus. We identify with Jesus. We identify with forgiveness of sins. It's the washing. It's the, it's the cleansing. We identify with new birth. We identify with life. We identify as being incorporated into the family of God. Baptism is this action that incorporates us. and it's the, it's the doorway into the life of the church. And then the meal allows us to come week after week and sit at the table and go, yeah, I did that. Now I get to eat. And that's spiritual food for a spiritual life. And that is your identity. Now here's, here's what we're about to do. We're about to come to the table. And as we come to the table and you're going to receive a broken piece of bread... And you dip it into the cup representing the body and blood of Christ. What I want you to do is is I want you to then come to the next station. And then if you've been baptized, I don't care if you were baptized as an infant. I don't care if you got baptized last month. It doesn't matter. If you are baptized, if you've been baptized, dip your finger into the water. Trace the sign of the cross on your forehead. Do, do, Do whatever. Whatever you need to do to touch the water. To feel and be aware that God has claimed you in the mystery of baptism. Somebody says, and you're sitting in the room and you're going, I've never been baptized. Maybe I'll just sit this one out. Don't you dare. Because you'll also notice that on every one of these stations, there's another little container. And inside of this container is a small vial of water. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to take it. If you've never been baptized, I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are. It doesn't matter. I want you to take that vial of water because here's why. God is calling you to the waters. God is calling you to the waters of baptism. God is calling you into that place where he says, it doesn't matter what you go through, like Carl read out of Isaiah, it doesn't matter whether you go through fire, you go through flames, you go through water, you go through whatever it is, hardship, difficulty, struggle, do not be afraid. You are mine. I have redeemed You're being called to the waters of baptism to remember, to identify. Why? Because he identified with you. Let's read it together one last time. Ready? Here it is. In Jesus' baptism, he identifies with you. In your baptism, you identify with him. If our ushers will come forward, or rather our servers, I'm sorry, if our servers will come forward and receive your elements,